Let me thank you again for your constant invitations to come here practically every year for, just as you said, for almost eight years now. Uh, when, when you uh, first invited me, I was a much uh, younger man, as you can imagine. <laughs> because I'm told that so many young politicians have spoken here today. <laughs> so it's time for an older politician <laughs> to speak. And I want to thank you again for your very, uh, for, for your confidence uh, in me and also your confidence in this platform to continuously expose some of the best minds that we have in our nation and some of the best ideas that we have <laughs> constantly every year. And I want to also commend all of the uh, previous speakers and to say that this is, in my view, one of the most important platforms that we have in our country to express our views, to exchange ideas. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, nation building in its classical sense really just refers to the formal and informal processes by which political leadership attempt to build a national identity, a national ethos, a national spirit, especially in ethnically and religiously diverse societies. But it is my own thesis that while government's role is in casting the vision and creating the environment for nationhood, the real building of nations is done and best seen through the accomplishments of many outside of political leadership. Men and women in business, in agriculture, in education, in entertainment, and the arts, who by just doing their business diligently, or serving faithfully, or making sacrifices, contribute to building the economies and social systems that ultimately build the nation. So this afternoon, I'm going to be sharing with you stories of some young people, many of whom I have had the privilege of meeting, who by just doing their own work faithfully have contributed to the building of our economy and the building of our nation. They have increased our national pride and our confidence they have created opportunities for others, as well as inspired others to be the best that they can be. My point is that we can contribute in profoundly transformative ways to changing our society by just doing our own bit with excellence. Let me begin with the exceptional role of young Nigerians in innovation and technology. On the 17th of April, I did a tour of technology businesses and hubs in Lagos. My first stop was Paystack. Here is a safe payment system which offers seamless money transactions between businesses and their customers. It was established in 2016 in the midst of the recession by two young Nigerian alumni of the Babcock University, Shola Kinlade and Ezra Olubi. Within the first three months of 2018, they have processed over 3 billion Naira and they generate about 40 billion Naira annually for Nigerian businesses. The company is today powering over 9,000 businesses that did not exist two years ago and they have created over 25,000 jobs. Paystack has almost 50 employees all of the employees are under 35 years of age. I was also at Andela. Andela is a multinational company specializing in training software developers, co-founded by the Nigerian-born Inya Boyeji, Ian Carnival, Jeremy Johnson, and Christiana Sass. The company estimates that in the next 10 years, there will be 1.3 million software development jobs and only 40,000 computer science graduates to fill them. So the company's vision is to change the culture of Nigeria and the African continent by developing talent and potential in Nigeria. Today, the company has over 1,000 employees worldwide. To enable that to happen, the role of government is to mainstream technology startups to be able to benefit from the incentives of industry. 
or we'll talk a bit more about that. Kola Uyene's Vinia Business Hub was also another point where I visited. This is one of the earliest business hubs in Nigeria. Here he has provided an efficient environment for many startups, most of which use each other's skills and technology cooperatively. But the pioneer of Nigerian hubs is clearly the co-creation hub, or CC hub, founded in 2010 by two young social entrepreneurs, Botsun Tijani and Femi Longe. It provides a platform for innovative technology to solve social problems. Nearly 50 Nigerian tech-driven dri businesses were incubated in the CC Hub. Some of them include the now famous uh, Budget, We Cyclers, Jenny Games, Life Bank, Gummy Way, Vacant Boards, Tracklist, Autobox, Stoughton, Grid Systems, and Marmalit. So many others. All these businesses were started, all of these businesses were started by young men and women under 35 years old. One of the startups that came out of Vinia Hub is called Flutterwave. Flutterwave was founded in May 2016 by Aboyeji again and a team of engineers and former bankers. This is a payment technology company that has since processed over $2 billion, not Naira now, worth of transactions on his payment platform. But, but Oviosu, Tai Oviosu's PAGA, I'm sure many of us have heard of PAGA, is in a class by itself. It is the leading mobile money transfer service in Nigeria. PAGA has 11,000 agents across Nigeria and 6 million users. The company has a staff strength of 200, and by, facilit by facilitating the payment for goods and services in this way, PAGA has enabled several other businesses and several other transactions to take place. In healthcare, many young people are solving huge problems with ease. I don't know how many of us have heard of LifeBank. Temigiwa, who, who founded LifeBank, and Ola Orekunri's Flying Doctors. These are two startups using technology and innovation to fill critical gaps in our healthcare industry. So LifeBank works on blood shortage problems in hospitals, and they save lives by speeding up blood donations and delivery to hospitals in Lagos. Their LifeBank app connects and ensures delivery of blood within 55 minutes. Ola Orekunri's Flying Doctors is the first air-operated emergency medical service in West Africa. Her company provides air ambulances from a pool of 20 aircrafts and highly trained medical personnel for emergency evacuations. But the building of a self-reliant nation must mean that the nation should at least be able to feed itself. The response of many young Nigerians to the, to the call of government to grow what we eat and to eat what we grow, and also to diversify our economy, is responsible for the phenomenal growth we have experienced in the past three years in the agricultural sector in Nigeria. The transformation in productivity and increase in investment that Nigerian talent and entrepreneurship have brought to agriculture is just remarkable. Farm crowding, and that's the name of a business, is a digital agricultural portal that crowdsources funding for farms across Nigeria, also founded in 2016 by Onyeka Akuma and three other young Nigerians. It operates like a mutual fund, pulling together money from multiple investors to establish farms and hire smallholder farmers to cultivate them, and then paying the investors dividends from the harvest from these farms. In December 2017, it succeeded in raising a million dollars in capital funding. And from November 2016 to date, it has over 3,000 rural farmers. All of these farmers have been able to, of course, to keep a job, to expand their operations, to increase their revenue as a result of the intervention of farm crowding. Farmers like Sunday Ohimai, who is a cassava farmer in Edo State, Esther, who is a maize farmer, from Dorua Babuje, just outside Jos. She recently improved her small acreage to a hectare. 
Uka AJ's Thriver Greek in, in Abuja uses the same business model as Farm Crowdy, also with great success. Four years before Farm Crowdy in 2012, Yemisi Raloe founded Saltry, a cassava processing company in the rural town of Aduawai. The starch it produces from the processed cassava is now used by several leading Nigerian manufacturing companies including Nestle, Unilever, and Nigerian breweries. As they increasingly replaced imported starch with locally sourced varieties, Saltry was one of the companies that found growth opportunities in the midst of the recession, as companies cut down on imports and explored locally available substitution, companies like Saltry Rose. In 2015, its revenues grew threefold, and in 2016, it began building a second production line. That is the success story of Sultry. But then there's also Abdul Fattah Sadiq Mutala, 25 years old from Batagarawa, local government in Katsina State. He founded BioGreen Agro in 2016. It builds greenhouses and hydroponic systems. What's a hydroponic system? It's a method of growing plants in the growth chambers without soil. Biogreen is producing now animal fodder in a climate controlled facility year round using his technology, using this technology. Biogreen Agro supplies farms and ranches now with fodder feed across the country. There's Kola Masha Babangona. It supports smallholder farms in northern Nigeria with financing, with agricultural input, with training and marketing. Masha is leveraging his experience in both the public and private sectors to deliver solutions that are changing the lives of thousands of struggling farmers, like Uma Magaji, for example. Uma Magaji is a 35-year-old farmer who owns 1.5 hectares of land. And as of this year, he has leased another 2.5 hectares. He plans to increase, and thanks to Babagana, he says his yields are two to three times what they were last year. He, he has now refurbished his house, bought a motorcycle, enrolled his children in school, and is hoping that he can perform the pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia within the next two years. Angela Delaja is the founder of Fresh Direct. She has perfected an innovative approach to farming in disused containers without soil and with very little water. What she's doing could very well be the beginning of a farming revolution in Nigeria. Also, while I was visiting the workstation, which is a hub in Victoria Island, I had the pleasure of drinking Shola Ladoja's fresh juice. The name of the fresh juice is Pick Me Up. It's made up by his startup, which is called Simply Green. Simply Green is a farm to bottle raw organic cold press juice company using organic and technologically harvested practices, meaning that they do not use chemicals or pesticides in growing their fruits and vegetables. This is a kind of innovation that young people have brought to agriculture. But in beauty and high fashion, there's very little doubt that young Nigerians have captured and in some instances dominated local and international imagination. So the groundbreaking works, and I'm sure some of us know, Deola Sego and Lisa Folawoyo, has spawned a whole new generation of, of Nigerian designers who are confidently using Nigerian and African print to make bold and unmistakable statements in high fashion. So today, Deola Sego has transformed the traditional Yoruba, Iro and Buba by using laser-cut ashoke to create the now famous Komole, so many of us know Komole. The toast of brides across the country. Lisa Folawoyo on her part has taken beaded African print to new levels of creativity. And both of them have inspired a new generation of designers like Andrea Iyama and 31-year-old uh, um, uh, um, Amaka Osakwe. Makio is the name of her brand. And she started at the age of 23. She's now celebrated in Vogue magazine and last year in the New Yorker as West Africa's most daring designer. Her use of Adire in many collections is an intentional ploy to boldly redefine 
elements of our culture. Of course, there are others. Orin culture, Maya Tafo are also making waves in men's clothing. In the beauty industry, Tara Fela Durotoe, of course, you know, uh, you know Fela, founder of the House of Tara, and Banke Meshida, BM Pro, stand out as pioneers who have influenced a whole generation of beauty experts and beauty products. They've opened a new vista in bridal makeup, Tara's training of hundreds of beauty experts, and her franchising of the House of Tara has created a new indigenously Nigerian beauty industry. This has created thousands of jobs for beauty experts and retailers. So now we see more ladies with their contours and highlights popping. <laughs> Elaine. Elaine Edozian Shobanjo, I'm sure some of us know Shomaya, and Joyce Jacob, have also introduced Hollywood glamour to the whole bridal makeup industry in Nigeria. By the way, what celebration today can beat the Nigerian wedding? From the makeup, dresses, to the decor, catering, the cakes, party planning, and photography. A whole new industry has developed around weddings by creative young people making an otherwise memorable event even more memorable and linking ethnicities across the country in fashion and ceremony. Today, everyone, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, Wea, Ashoebi, they even call it Ashoebi, their wedding ceremonies are becoming increasingly similar, not just by uniformity that results in the loss of culture or tradition, but by creativity that brings a standard while accentuating tradition and culture. The whole nature of the moderation, yet preservation of the traditional engagement ceremony is such a testament to the depth of thought and creativity of those young Nigerians who are internationalizing our wedding ceremonies. The Nigerian wedding has become so popular that the film Wedding Party was a major international commercial success. But it is perhaps in the literal arts, especially the written and the spoken word, that we see the difficult issues of nation building most poignantly confronted by young people. A new generation of literary touch bearers have emerged. Talents like Chimamanda Adichie, Helen Habila, Teju Ko, Chika Onigwe, Chigozie Obioma, Chibundu Onuzo, Abubakar Ibrahim, Ehosa Emaswen, Ayobami Adebayo, El Nathan John, and many more. And poets, you also have poets like Titi Lokwe Shonuga, DK Chukumerije, picking up the baton from the Shoyinkas and the Achebes. Their works expose the complications and solutions to the issues associated with the mentality of persons in the post colonial state. How a multi ethnic, multi religious society can and how a multi-ethnic and a multi-religious society can thrive and survive, and how the major questions that emerge from all of these records and histories can be used to build a nation. The reflection and introspection from their talents, boldness, their precision, their undiluted expressions and call to action, invoking all of us exactly what nation building and greatness is made of. They are not timid and they represent a growing class of sophistication and confidence that confront lingering post-civil war and even post-colonial aches and pains. The highlight, they, they highlight the hypocrisy of ethno-religious barriers often set by the elite for selfish advantage, and they expose the underlying selfishness and failure of statemanship that exploits false lines for political and personal benefit. They highlight the cancer of systemic corruption how it has eaten into the fabric of our society and cost us lives, years, and retrogression. These writers and poets explore, explain, and humanize the difficult issues around social justice, the humiliation and delegitimization that poverty brings, and the failures of the rule of law. In Chimamanda Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun, one of the main characters is a university professor and he tells his houseboy the following, and I quote, he said, there are two answers to the things they will teach you about 
and the real answer and the answer that you must give to pass. So there are two answers, the real answer and the answer that you must give to pass. So you must read books and learn both answers. I'll give you two books, the professor said, excellent books. They will teach you that a white man called Mongo Park discovered River Niger. That is rubbish. Uh, people fished in the Niger long before Mongo Park's grandfather was born. But in your exam, write that it was Mongo Park. End of quote. <laughs> this reminds me of one of the proverbs that Chinua Achebe popularized. He said, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. An affirmation of the truth that nation building is also about storytelling and the importance of telling our own stories and writing our own histories. Anieta Isong, her book is called Radio, the book is called Radio Sunrise, is a scathing indictment of bribery in the journalism profession. The watchdogs of our democracy are sometimes mere captives of corrupt politicians and that news and its analysis may often just be paid for. There's no doubt at all from what Anieta Isong says in her book and also from, from experience that grand corruption remains the most enduring threat to our economy. Just to give an example, three billion US dollars was stolen in what was called the so-called strategic alliance contract sometime in 2013. Three Nigerians were responsible. Today, three billion dollars is one trillion naira. Our budget, the entire budget, and budgets are estimates, not actual cash, is seven trillion. So if three people made away with one trillion, and the entire national budget is seven trillion, you cannot wonder how come it is that the economy will struggle. When oil in our country was selling for 100 to 114 dollars a barrel, the government then spent 99 billion on transport and agriculture got 15 billion. And uh, trans uh, uh, transport got 15 billion, agriculture got 14 billion. All the ministries together, all those ministries mentioned, got 139 billion. Today, with all prices between 60 and 70, power works and housing can get 415 billion. Transport gets 80, agriculture gets 65, and the total is 560 billion. How come we can do more with less income? How come we're able to invest in infrastructure? How come we can do the Lagos Kano Standard Gauge Railway, the Mambila Hydro, the second Niger Bridge, with 60% less income that we earned a few years ago? The truth is, just as Isong said, if you control corruption, you can do more with far less. D.K. Chukumerije, I'm sure some of us know him, reminds us in his powerful poem, the revolution, that the, 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 the poem is titled, The Revolution Has No Tribe. The revolution has no tribe. And that our, he reminds us that our, that our destinies as Nigerians, no matter our tribe or religion, are inextricably tied together. What affects one affects all. Suffering neither knows tribe nor tongue. He says, and I quote him, do you not know that poverty is not an man? He will not spare the rest of us and afflict only the Isha. He will, stop, he will step over the river and come across the border. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. Do you not know that corruption is not from naked? He will not hear that Ife had no dealings with Modakeke. He will wake up all of our children at night with hunger. So when the drums sound, let everyone answer. Do you know that our enemies have no faces, that they are indigents of no state, that they come from no place? And if this boat capsizes, every one of us will go under. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. Do not say, I am an Iroko when the forest is burning. Do not say, I am an Obeche when the forest is burning. Our differences will not prevent us from perishing together. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. Nations, that's end of, end of quote. <laughs> now, 
Nations, nations are built by the contributions of many, but many of us forget the public servants, those who work for governments, despite, the, despite sometimes poor remuneration. A few examples of these public servants, Damilola Ogumbi was 28 years old when as the first female general manager of the Lagos State Electricity Board, she supervised the building of the five independent power plants in Lagos State and was responsible for providing solar power to over 200 schools and primary health centers in Lagos State. Today, she is the first female managing director of the Federal Rural Electrification Agency, responsible for providing uninterrupted power to 13 federal universities and seven teaching hospitals. This is a new project called Energizing Education, which is pioneering from the Ministry of Power, Works and Housing. She started the project to provide power to Nigeria's largest markets already. The first phase of that project has been completed in the Sabungari market in Kano, and the construction phase of the Ariaria market in Aba, the construction phase of the, of the power center in Ariaria market has also started. Afalabi Mukwede handles the N Power program, a major feature of the federal government's social investment policy. The program engages 200,000 graduates across all local government. Its applications come through a portal developed by Softcom, a company of young Nigerian engineers. The process of engagement goes through that platform, and millions have applied through that platform. Tochi Nwachuku is a special assistant to the president on power privatization, responsible for transmission, doing innumerable transmission projects across the country. Ime Okon is a senior special assistant to the president, advising on railways, roads, airports, and other infrastructure projects. Maria Masha is a medical doctor, senior special assistant to the president on IDPs. And with BC, who is uh, Ogumba Dejo, both have been working with IDPs in Maiduguri since August 2015. Recently, they have been managing a newly built learning center and a home for 1,500 orphans in Maiduguri. Mohamed Braimer works on the Northeast Humanitarian Technology Hub, where groundbreaking innovation is applied to tackle humanitarian challenges. And all of these individuals, all of them, young people working in government, young people doing creative things in, in, in governments, I've mentioned only those who are working in, in, in the federal government, and there are hundreds of others working in state governments. But often forgotten, very often forgotten, are the excellent teachers in primary and secondary schools. Take the wonderful ingenuity and dedication of Emea for Chigozie, she is a secondary school teacher in the FCT in Abuja. She's earned several awards for extraordinary efforts in raising our next generation. This microbiolo microbiology and chemistry graduate of the University of Nigeria, Nsuka, was named the best science teacher and recognized specially for exceptional performance in preparing students in the federal capital territory in quiz and project exhibitions. She's also recently received another award for contributing to the 774 Young Nigerian Scientists Presidential Award competitions. As a chemistry teacher, the success rate of a mere for students in the past five years of WAEC and NECO ranged from 87% to 92%. There's also, there's also Doreen Omorigi. She's a school teacher, primary school teacher, and also now works in the secondary school from Edo State. She also works out of the Federal Capital Territory. She's a graduate of chemistry education. And she deserves this mention because of the consistent way that she goes beyond the call of duty in discharging her responsibilities. Even as a youth copper serving in a primary school, she organized a workshop for teachers on the use of primary science kits. She was soon able to take her school towards winning the award for the first best state school in Nigeria in science. Ms. Omorigbe herself was the best science teacher in her school for three consecutive years. Quite remarkably, she's been able to use her knowledge in producing soap, sanitizer, and disinfectants, many of which were used even during the Ebola crisis a few years ago. 
It's just amazing the incredible work that these individuals do. These are the true nation builders, the teachers, the farmers, the entrepreneurs, the public servants who work in this country. They pay their taxes, they bear their hardships, but they remain focused. They are determined. Most of them, just as Abiyonu Jinodu said, are survivors. But they are determined and they are committed. They are the ones who recognize that, that, they, that even where change is slow, it will come. They are prepared to do their own part day by day. Their own dreams of greatness, their hard work are the building blocks of our nation. And how about the young men and women of the police and armed forces who lay their lives on the line daily to protect us? The story of late Colonel Muhammadu Abu Ali has been told often. As commander of the 272 Task Force Battalion, his battalion was responsible for the capture, for the recapture of Bama, Baga, Mongono, and later Konduga. He was decorated for bravery and excellence. He was decorated for bravery and excellence. He had become a terror to Boko Haram insurgents, but he and four others were killed in an ambush. He was just 36 years old, survived by a wife and three children. The story of the late Sergeant Chukudi Boko, Igboko went viral when he confronted armed robbers in a daylight robbery at the Zenith Bank in Oweri, Imo State. He killed one of the robbers. He killed one of the robbers, but the robbery was foiled, but he and another officer, Sergeant Sunday Agbo, died of the gunshot injuries that they sustained during the attack. Both of them left wives and children. It is to these men and women who fight to defend our nation from terrorism and crime that we owe the preservation of our nationhood. Some of them do not die, they just lose their limbs, they lose their sight, they lose their hearing. The widows and widowers and children of these brave men and women bear the pain and anguish of loss by themselves for many years. And then there is the entertainment industry, whose main advantage lies in how it transcends tribe, tongue, and location to bring joy to the screens of millions of Nigerians. Think how much bliss the music videos of Clarence Peters and the best-selling comedies of Ayo Makun, A.Y., Basket Mouth, Apororo, Chioma Emeruwa, Chigao, Fouls the Bad Guy, Funke Akinele, Jennifer, and the talented singer and comedian Kenny Black have brought to audiences at home and abroad. All of these people. <laughs> They proudly fly our flag, and they make us proud. Of course, one of our favorites, especially at the villa, is the one that you just saw, Senator M.C. Toguai, His Excellency the President. <laughs> his impersonations of the President has the President himself nearly falling off his chair with laughter. <laughs> and then there's the newest generation emerging as we speak on Instagram and WhatsApp, like La Sisi Eleno, something just happened right now. <laughs> Can you see this fellow? Something just happened right now. <laughs> and William Suchemba, you know I don't like what I hate. Stand-up comedy in Nigeria owes much to the pioneering efforts and the mentorship of Ali Baba. He literally created a whole industry. A.Y. Ayomako is not just successful, he has continuously given a new generation of comedians a platform with his A.Y. live shows. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity." End of quote. Few will deny the incredible dividends that Nollywood has brought to Nigeria. 
Jason Njoku and his wife uh, and his wife Mary Remy, owners of Iroko and Rock TV, pioneered live streaming of Nollywood movies, taking Nollywood to the world. They've also provided opportunities for hundreds of production personnel and agents. For a lot of these, it is to Mo Abudu, founder of Ebony Live TV, which already airs in 49 countries and a prolific creator of high quality Afrocentric entertainment content that the pride of place must be given. Mo has continuously sought to change the negative perceptions of Africa and Nigeria by telling African Nigerian stories from a purely African perspective. Her project, which you all, most of us know, The Wedding Party, became the highest grossing Nigerian movie of all time. Wherever you go in the world today, whether you are in an airplane or in a department store, anywhere in the world, you can hear Nigerian music. The credit for taking Nigerian music to the world must go to stars like Tiwa Savage, David O, Olamide, Whiskey, the Waje, and so many others. Their creativity and talent has benefited our nation's image and put the spring in the steps of so many young and aspiring entertainers. The credit for the discovery, grooming, and production of many world-class Nigerian acts and records and building true Nigerian brands is the likes of Don Jazzy, Don Jazzy's Marvin Records, and Banky W of EME. As government, our business is to create the environment for entrepreneurs to do business, to work on access to cheap credit, and on providing the infrastructure, especially power, and greater broadband penetration. But the task of nation building is never done. The builders confront new problems every day. Today, we are confronted with the remnants of Boko Haram, with, farm, with farmer herdsman clashes, with the potential of ethno-religious conflict. We have to feed ourselves. We have to provide millions of new jobs, as every day, more people are added to the population. The, joy, the job of the builder is not to complain or to escape but to confront and to resolve. But what we can do together to ensure that we don't spend the rest of our days looking forward to the past, frozen by inaction, we resolve to do the same things, that we must not do the same things over and over again while hoping for better results. I believe the solution is in building that Nigerian bridge. The bridge will not be one that is built of steel or bricks or mortar. It is one that will be built of the strongest materials of all, our will to excel as Nigerians, our commitment to build a new society, men and women of a new Nigerian tribe. This is a bridge that connects us across tribes, across ethnicities, across dialects, a bridge that connects us across religion, politics, and across even generations. Every one of us can travel on this bridge, a strong and steady bridge, a bridge that rises from innovation and traditions that span the tro troubled waters of our past, a bridge that will withstand the powerful forces of fear, division and exclusion, a bridge that can take the traffic of all our best ideas, our creativity, our human and material resources daily to the destination of our dreams. This bridge will be built with the wisdom of the elderly and the strength of the youth. All of us deserve some accolades. God bless you. Thank you very much.